Good morning, everyone. My name is Ricardo. I'm the current maintainer of the Soyo web platform. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Stephanie and Monica, for organizing this event in this um, beautiful place. <laughs> it's really nice to see all the nationalities in this uh, little place. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Today, we are going to talk about some design tips for building web applications, but if you are not into web, you will also be able to apply it to your desktop applications if, if you want. Maybe not for console, but you will be fine. <laughs> so in this session, we will see uh, how we've improved Soyo in order to make your lives easier in order to design uh, your web applications. We will talk about this little thingy that we call Web Styler, and then uh, we will follow with, with uh, composing components, um, uh, state-driven GUIs, and we will see what we've been bringing into Soyo in the, into the next release. So we've been working hard during the couple of uh, last years. We've been fixing literally hundreds of bugs and implementing feature requests. And this has been uh, possible thanks for the help of the community. Soyo is a uh, very community-driven pro product. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for contributing to opening tickets. Um, I know that there are a lot of people that are going to see a couple of uh, fixes or feature requests that I'm going to present today that uh, you've been uh, involved with. So yeah, thank you. The first one is popovers. It took a while to implement this one, but we finally have it in uh, mobile, desktop, and also on, on the web platform. It's really easy to use. You just design a container, and you can create an instance and include it into a, any of uh, any control. It can write events as well, so you can uh, listen to them and react to them. The webmap viewer. This initially was a bug <laughs> that you uh, reported. The initial problem was <coughs> we couldn't add uh, more than one pin on the map, one uh, marker. So we had to rebuild the control from scratch in order to support that. But luckily, we currently have support not only for multiple markers, but also you can use any custom tile provider that offers raster tile maps or even vectorial. So it's really fast. By default, we are using the OpenStreetMap <laughs> tile provider, which is free, and you can use it uh, freely. We have uh, free geocoding for doing a uh, search, and that's also uh, free. And free routing. Uh, no, the Canary Islands is an appearing there because <laughs> I don't have a road, a direct road, but yeah, from Malaga, you can go to Andernach. The, this should be the, the better way to get by car. If you create a, a road like, like this, it will give you uh, some uh, tips like the distance in meters and and the estimated time that you will, it will take to, to arrive to your destination. And you can add multiple uh, locations, and uh, it will uh, create the route. Dark mode uh, for web. This was the last target to get dark mode, but we finally get there. You can set the, the color mode per session. So for example, you can have a user and a user preference uh, the, or a cookie or uh, whatever you want to store the preferred color mode for that specific user. So for example, I use the forum in dark mode and that would be possible to do it with, with, with uh, Soyo as well. So 
in order to implement that mode in Soyo, we had to upgrade Bootstrap from Bootstrap 4 to Bootstrap 5, and that caused uh, uh, some problems for some users that were using a custom Bootstrap theme. So I really want to continue uh, updating the Bootstrap dependency without breaking too many uh, projects. So I created a little tool. This is an external tool that you can just download and use and create your, uh, your Bootstrap themes. Uh, it's really easy, it's really basic. This is uh, like an early uh, preview uh, that you can use you know, to, to create your Bootstrap themes, not only for Soyo, but you can reuse these uh, themes into your marketing website, for example. So if you want to create a web application that looks really uh, similar or the same as your marketing website, it's going to be uh, really easy. You can enable and disable shadows, uh, rounded buttons. You can customize the radius of the buttons, and yeah, also the uh, all the colors, the primary color, the background of the web page. So you don't have to implement the opening event anymore. You can just uh, define the background color, and it will be applied to any a page that you have. It's pretty easy. Um, let me try this. As you can see here, you can select the Bootstrap version. So if Bootstrap creates a new version called, I don't know, Bootstrap 6, you will be able to add this new target and without modifying your, your, your model, you will be able to export it again and you can just drop into Soyo as, as usual. <coughs> it's completely free. Um, this, is not the, this is not the final goal. The goal is going to be to eventually have uh, all these settings integrated into Soyo IDE, but well, it's a little step forward into creating all these web styles easier. If you have any uh, suggestion about web styler when you start using it, just contact me or open a new issue. Um, that would be cool to, to continue improving it and knowing how you are using this product in order to integrate it finally into the SOI ID. Now, composing components. And um, we will be talking about uh, websites, but you can do the same in desktop or mobile. This is, uh, uh, <laughs> this is coming from a feature request, which was talking about being able to uh, add controls into your web toolbar. And we will do it. But in the meantime, you don't really uh, have to be waiting or depending on Soyo in order to do these uh, kind of uh, little things. I mean, for, for the toolbar, we have the Soyo toolbar, the web toolbar, but it's a pretty opinionated way of uh, displaying a navigation bar. You can use any uh, design that you want in web, so you are not uh, tied to Soyo in order to do that. Let me show you. This is basically uh, just a container that contains a, a web rectangle, a green one. And on top of that rectangle, it has the label, the search field, and a button that is going to display a pop-up whenever you press it. It's going to just uh, rise some events that you can capture on your web page, for example. So yeah, as you can see, you can press on the title. It's going to work pretty similar to what we have with the web toolbar. So when I change 
the text field, it's going to rise an event and it's going to update this uh, text label. And if you press on the button, it's going to display a popover displaying a couple of containers inside another container. Let's see how that works. See, it's just a plain container. You have the title. It's going to write an event, title preset, that you can capture on your uh, web page. The same with the popover. Whenever you press on the button, it's going to create a new instance of the toolbar menu container, and it's going to show the popover. If you want to download and play with this project, you can just scan the barcode and it's going to point you to the GitHub project uh, where you can download it. It's pretty easy. Now, as I said, an horizontal navigation toolbar is just a way of uh, creating uh, navigation. On the right side, we have a vertical navigation that it's created using a technique called atomic design, which is basically you create some containers, like for example the, the icon, and the icon can have a couple of uh, different states, and you can create reusable components and combine them in order to create bigger controls. There's a blog post I wrote uh, the, on last year in order to create this project. Now, it's pretty interesting to learn all these uh, methodologies and, and stuff, but at the moment, I don't really recommend to organize the, the components in the way they, they say, because at least with, with Soyo, it's going to be a bit difficult to find your contracts if you create a lot of uh, folders, uh, one for atoms, another one for organisms, another one for molecules. It's going to be quickly, uh, <laughs> will be a bit difficult to try to locate your specific icon. But it's really interesting to start learning different things and I don't know, just uh, try them. There's another pattern which is called state driven GUIs. Now, if we compare what we used to do in, in our applications, uh, writing uh, a, a control in an imperative way, you will basically be defining a step by step what uh, you want your application to do. At, uh, on every single event. The other way would be declarative, which uh, would be something like HTML, where you just write some, uh, some, uh, some tags in a text file, and it's going to be uh, the, the, the computer. It's going to display and render all the, all the rectangles and pixels and, uh, and all that. We will be trying to do uh, today something in the middle using uh, those states. S uh, so here is an example of how an imperative container works. I don't know if you've been working like this before. This is the typical use case. You fill a text field, and the text field is going to enable or disable the button. And whenever you press on the button, it's going to rise an event, but it's also going to disable the text field. It's also going to display our progress wheel. It's going to disable the button itself. It's going to do a lot of things. Now, how is working like that at the moment? I do. <laughs> There 
there is a better way. And this is what you typically get from a designer. You will get a Figma design, for example, or a Photoshop snippet, and they will say, good luck implementing this. And you can actually do it uh, really easily with Soya, and it makes a lot of sense. You can create a couple of different states, which is bas basically a couple of uh, states inside an enumeration, like for example, typing, submitting, submitting, success, and an error. And whenever you change the state of the of the container, it's it's the only the place where you will be uh, enabled and disabling controls, uh, displaying controls, or changing the color. It's pretty much the same code, but it looks much more easier. It looks like uh, you know exactly where you have to change something in order to achieve the, the same uh, result that you you would do in an imperative container uh, control. So the only place where you will be changing the, the state could be from uh, an, uh, an external command, like for example the website could change the, the state of this container, but also the control cell can change its own state. For example, when you press any key on the text field, it's going to change the state of this container to typing state. Whenever you press the submit button, it's going to raise the, the event, so the web page can capture the, the event and implement it, but it also changes the, the state into submitting. You are not leaking any property, you are not leaking any, any control, you can have everything inside that container except of the state in private. So let's see how that works. They work pretty much the same. You can type in the state-driven control something in the imperative, the same. We can press both, and they work the same if you don't have any bug. By the way, the, the, the outcome is going to be random. So if you change the, the text, it's going to enable the button again. If it's empty, it's going to disable the, the button, and the same as with um, the state-driven control. Now, the benefit uh, that you have with the state-driven control is that you don't have to fill the field and press on a button and wait for the reply of, a, of an external API or an external database in order to double check that. When you submit a correct answer, it's going to show the that's right word uh, sentence in green. What you can do is just change the state and double check that everything is working as you put a sped. So if you are doing automated tests, it's really easy to test this control. And if you want to change anything on this control, you know that you will only have to go to the state computed property. This is the enumeration. You have typing, submitting, success, and error. And whenever you change the state, the code is going to be the same as in imperative, but only in one place. So if, for example, our client says that uh, the, the user should be able to press again on submit uh, they want to submit it again, we should be able to change it only in one place. We won't have to be finding who is responsible of enable the, the, the button or where are we changing the, 
the control in the imperative uh, container. Um, as you can see, everything is private except of the state. In the imperative uh, container, you have to be leaking some controls uh, in order to be able to change them from the, the outside. Or you should be able to uh, create a method that changes uh, the controls. What they, yeah, the, the question is why only four are not uh, having another empty state. Um, now, uh, what, they, what they say, uh, I didn't invent this, uh, this pattern, what they say is try to reduce the, the different states as much as possible. They even, uh, when you see this pattern, they will uh, combine the success and error into one, like outcome. But uh, this is up to you. If you want to, to create an empty state and uh, avoid checking this uh, condition, uh, that's totally fine. Yeah. Just uh, give it a try. And if it works uh, better for you having a, another state, that's, that's fine. So if you want to download this project again, here's uh, the, the, QR, the QR code. These controls are easier to maintain, easier to test using automated testing. Uh, but yeah, of course, as any other pattern, it might be overkill for simpler controls, but it's uh, really interesting to, to give it a try. Now, for the next version of uh, Soya Web, we are planning to add more tools in order to create your designs easier or, or more beautiful. We will be able to resize the, the buttons, which wasn't possible until now. You will be able to create an outlined version of the button not only on buttons, but also on web segment and button. And also in the web segment and button, you will be able to, <laughs> and this is a feature request. Um, you will be able to, to, create, to change the indicator of every segment, and it also works on on outlined web segmented buttons. Wait. Control sets are going to uh, be there in Soya Web again in the R2 release. And we also improved the web data source for webless box. Now, uh, it was possible in the past to add a lot of uh, rows using a web data source, but we've simplified the interface. Sorted primary keys and unsorted primary keys aren't needed anymore. So you only have to uh, create the column data array, specifying the column names. And if you want to uh, have one of the columns to be sortable or not, uh, you will have to, of course, return the row amount and the row data. Now, how the web list box works is whenever it needs a couple of rows because uh, the user is uh, scrolling or he jumping into another place of the web list box, the web data source interface is going to call this row data method and you will have to return an array uh, containing the, the row data. And it supports the row tags and and everything that you've been using in, uh, without the web data source. It's not only simple, but it's also faster. You can literally display millions of rows in a webless box, and I want to prove that. This is an example project. 
<coughs> using a humble SQLite database, displaying one million records. It's pretty fast. You can scroll, and it's instant. So you can see it's a million records. You can select a row. You can sort them, and it's pretty much instant. It was possible in the current version of Soya, but whenever you were uh, scrolling, it took, uh, in order to display the very same uh, example, it took like six seconds uh, to display the, the, the data in that uh, specific section. And uh, if you refresh the, the page, it's going to be instant as well, as you can see. It's pretty cool. I'm really happy about that. Thank you. <laughs> um, that was the last demo. But before we go, one last thing. <laughs> Jeff did a new spoiler yesterday. We've been having fun in 2023 about uh, web performance. We've improved every single uh, metric that we've been analyzing. This is an example project uh, running in since uh, Web 1 until the latest version uh, back then in 2023. We've jumped from uh, around 250 requests per second in a handle URL event. We've jumped uh, to 1,000 requests per second, more or less. And this is just a benchmark. Where an example project running on my computer. In your computer or on your server, it will vary a bit, but uh, with improving. 2024 R2, we will do it again. And you will be able to <coughs> serve requests in under two milliseconds on average, which is faster than the previous release. And we will be able to not only uh, serve 1,000 requests per second, but 9,000 requests per second. The end goal is double that uh, metric, anyway, my personal goal. <laughs> we compare web one versus web two. It's just crazy. The numbers are crazy. <laughs> Any question? Thank you, everyone, for, <laughs> for reporting the bugs. And Jeremy, for example, for reporting memory leaks, and you as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <sir. laughs>